John Sanders was was a ball of fire. Uh, there were some who thought he was a shit of the first water. Uh, but he got things done, and he was very loyal to people who were loyal to him. And when things went down the swanee with action, he, 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 was, he was pretty good. He was very good, in fact. He, he tried his best. He did his best. But um, uh, I can't really remember how Pat got in touch with me. I, you see, he got for action. He needed an editor who was a hands-on editor. And what he got, he, he chose a guy called Jeff Kemp. Uh, Jeff Kemp had been my editor on Lion, and Jeff was a very, very good, very cynical, very sceptical man, whom basically you had to really pull your finger out to get anything past him, to get a good, to get any kind of story past him, and had to be really good. And, uh, uh, and he'd been in comics, uh, British comics, since the 1950s. And he was, he was a very good bass player, uh, and he used to play with, um, with Wally Fawkes and the Troglodytes, uh, at for, uh, uh, for Wally's band, the Troglodytes. And um, he, he also knew a lot of people like Hockney and Peter Blake. We used to go to uh, uh, parties at Peter Blake's down in Somerset, I think, when he was still with his wife, Jan Howes. And, um, he, you know, he, he, he had his finger on the, on the pulse. And he, he was a very good editor, and he was a very good mechanical editor. He was good on... He was a very good mechanical editor. Jeff Kemp was a very good mechanical editor. He was terrific on deadlines. He got the stuff out. You know, he didn't... He, he, so this is what Pat needed. Pat was crap like that. He, I mean, he admitted it. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't someone, he was someone who, who told a good story, spun lots of ideas, got things going, and then dumped it in Jeff's lap, and Jeff got the stuff, you know, on time, to the printers, to the uh, typesetters, etc. And uh, uh, Jeff, I think, brought me in because, I think, John Wagner was doing stuff for uh, Action. It had started, and John was fairly well cheesed off with it. Something had happened, he, I don't know, he could. And he was doing a, a strip called Black Jack. And he'd gone it to a certain point, and he, it bored the big Jesus out of him. And he just gave up, he, he just gave it up. And Jeff rang me one, one day and said, can you carry on with Blackjack? I need a script yesterday or there's going to be a hole in the paper. You know, there's going to be two pages which, which are not filled. Uh, can you do something overnight? I said, okay. And I carried on and carried on. <laughs> it was a black boxer. And I'm, I'm not a sportsman. I, you know, I, it's not my field. I can't stand sports. And uh, I had this black, so I said to him, I said, look, at, at the time, uh, my then wife, Anne, and I had, uh, had a, a bistro in West Hampstead, and, uh, and also a, a sort of rather posh restaurant called Capability Brown in West Hampstead, in West End Lane. And uh, we had a girl who was working for us whose boyfriend was a record producer. And I said, look, I tell you what, let's turn, let's turn Black Jack into, into a rock star. Because I know someone who can take me backstage, you know, who can take me to a rock concert and take me to a rock recording studio and, and I can get all, you know, and do some... And he said, yeah, great, great idea, fine. Oh, God, it was, it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. I hate it. It was the worst, it was the worst job I ever did. It was just desperate. I can't even remember how I, I ended it, but I mean, it was just, we cut its throat. I mean, really, it was just dreadful. Uh, but again, you know, I could deliver, and Jeff wanted people who could deliver. And they started doing things like, you know, got any ideas for Dredger? Anybody could have a go at Dredger. I think John was having a go at Dredger, I think you're right. Uh, and any writer could have a go at Dredger. And what you needed to do 
was come up with a startling idea, a startling first two or three frames, really, you know, hit you in the face sort of stuff. Uh, I mean, I remember there was one, there was one dredger, it started off um, with a guy going into a phone booth, a uh, desperate looking guy, goes into a phone booth, um, picks up the phone, I, th I think it's just, picks up the phone, and the phone booth explodes. Boom. Ah, jeez, what, you know, what, what God's name is happening there? And uh, I think that was one of Pat's. And uh, I came up with an idea. I, you've got to remember, this is 30 years ago, and the, the ideas we were coming up with, we, we, we were young men, we were having a lot of fun, and we were having a lot of violent fun. And I said to Jeff, I said, I, uh, Dredger, I said, I've got, I've got a terrific idea. I said, Dredger kills a priest. Kills a priest, Catholic priest. I got a big thing about Catholics. Kills a Catholic priest, you know, with his, with his great big magnum, bam. Great, M wonderful. I could do the story around it now. And unfortunately, it wasn't a bad story, but they gave it to the old artist who did Carson's Cubs in Lyon, and it was just diabolical. I mean, it just, they didn't give it to a Spanish artist who could have put some oomph in it or, you know, some violence in it. Uh, they gave it to Ted Holmes, a, a, a great artist, Fred Holmes, I should say, not Ted Holmes. They gave it to Fred Holmes. He's a terrific artist, but he, he was very good at writing, at, at drawing comical, you know, uh, adventure stories featuring uh, boy footballers. But, um, when, when you got, uh, 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 what used to happen, you used to come up with ideas, you used to pitch ideas, and Pat would give you a ring and say, um, oh, I like this one, and uh, come on in, we'll, we'll, we'll go over it. And uh, so, okay, you'd go in, and Pat would always work after seven o'clock. So it would be in, in the Fleetway buildings, after seven o'clock, you hadn't had anything to eat, uh, and you, for the next, and you were there for something like three hours, and you, you started off, and he'd say, well, what's the idea? And you'd say, what the idea was. And he'd be electric as usual, he'd be tossing his pencil up and climbing up on desks and doing all this kind of malarkey, and you'd be sitting there trying to follow him and smoking, chain smoking, and you'd get the idea. The idea would start off at A, and you'd get it to, you'd, you'd got to come around in a circle to, to B. And what happened with Pat is, you got A, and then you went to B, C, D, E. It went all around for three hours. You were arguing about this story. And you finally got back to what you'd started with. And he'd say, ah, I like that. That's the idea. That's, that's what we ought to do. We'll do that. And you said, Pat, three hours. I did this. We, we, this is the idea I came up with. And he'd say, no, no, no. He said, it's always well to, to get it talked out and, you know, really get down to it. Much better that way. He was a bundle of electric energy. It probably still is. And he was he, a very good ideas man, uh, Pat Mills. Uh, but working with him was akin to being sort of lashed to a voltami an amateur or something like that. You know, things going absolutely mad. Um, right, I finished that one. Oh, I'll just go into it. Um, I was talking to Jed about um, uh, the conditions of really what we were doing in the, in, for action, and for battle, and for 2000 AD in the early days, we were basically, uh, a, a lot of uh, young men, thoroughly enjoying themselves, um, you know, cranking out stuff, uh, and getting, actually, a pretty good living um, out of it. I mean, I, I honestly can't remember the, the actual, uh, 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 what, what one get, got the script, but really, it was, no, I can't remember. Ah, uh, you can edit all that out, I'll, I'll go on. Um, oh, 
three pages for two pages three no okay um basically we were in the late 70s mid to late 70s we were a load of young men who were having a thoroughly good time we were enjoying ourselves actually cocking a snook at authority because we were writing stories which had never the kinds of stories which had never been done before that was it we were having a go at authority we were anti-authoritarian most of us were were anti-government of some sort or another uh, a lot of us took drugs uh, a, a lot of us um, went on uh, marches a lot of us led a kind of vaguely alternative lifestyle and um, the money we were getting from uh, what we were doing uh, 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 was actually very good and it was certainly better than say you know being a clerk in a bank or something like that because you know you, you had more fun and this area of writing this of popular fiction this type of popular fiction storytelling for a vaguely juvenile but but probably more than you know sort of teenage early 20s kind of uh, um, audience has always been extremely well paid uh, the guy who invented billy bunter charlie hamilton uh, frank richards uh, back in the before the first world war before the great war he was copying for all the work he was doing and he was cranking out something like probably uh, three stories of 20,000 words a week plus uh, half of a 60,000 word novella uh, plus a couple of other you know a few uh, parts of a serial and he was copying about you know over 2,000 pounds a year and this was in 1910 11 12 pro rata we were doing the same thing in in the 1970s we were making a lot of money the only thing which we, we, we which we didn't have we didn't have the rights to our own uh, characters the characters we dreamed up or the characters we were given and the stories we, we were given and that that all came later uh, and I, I suspect that probably they're, they're doing far better now because you do get royalties and things like that we didn't get royalties what happened was you signed your name on the back of a check and everything you did that was paid for by that check went straight into the great moor of ipc magazines uh, and you never saw it again and if you sometimes you could con people out of it like some editor would use a story of yours and you'd say for pete's sake you know uh, that's my story you know, and you'd get some kind of honorarium, you know, you'd screw some minor honorarium figure out of them. But otherwise, it, it, but really, I'd, I certainly didn't mind because I was funding uh, a, a pretty good lifestyle. Uh, I, I, my ex-wife, my then wife, Anne and I had two restaurants in West Hampstead and, uh, you know, we were doing actually quite well. And uh, it, it, people sort of, look at that kind of uh, that area of writing and they think well you know it's, it's rubbish but it isn't it's still <coughs> it's still telling a story it's still grabbing your reader by the throat <coughs> and pulling him in or indeed her and uh, making them want to know what's going on what's happening uh, not even necessarily what's going to be happening next week. What on earth is happening now? Um, that's the kind of thing I wanted to get over in, in Hell's Highway, which I did for action. What on earth is going on? What, you know, who are these secret government figures who are troubling our two heroes? And did, what, did why you, are they so... Did, did you and the other writers share genuine sort of social concern that we're wanting to educate sort of children and adolescents? Good God, no. No, not, not really. No, I, you can't say that. <coughs> What we were doing, we were having the time of our lives poking fun at authority and trying to dream up bizarre storylines, ultra-violent storylines. The guy who um, did uh, Hookjaw was a Scot uh, called Ken Armstrong. 
who did most of the hook jaw things. And he was an upright, uh, son of the manse kind of guy. And uh, he was uh, a weekend soldier. He was, in the, he was an officer in the Territorial Army. And he went off and, you know, played soldiers at the weekend. And he you know, sort of uh, rigid and saluted and, and was an authority figure. And then during the week, he'd come and do, uh, do hook jar stories, which were dreadful. They were violent and hook jaw grabbing people's heads and wrenching them off and blood gapping all over the bloody place. It was brilliant. It was, we, we, were, we were young men having a hell of a lot of fun. And it, it, you know, that, that's what, there was no great idea that we should be, uh, you know, sort of educating or, or anything like that. Anybody who says that is lying. They're, they're making it up. We were storytellers. Uh, some of us were brilliant storytellers. Some of us were okay storytellers. Uh, uh, but we were, you know, really wanting to tell a story to grab the uh, the readers and, and and make them enjoy, you know, half an hour of fun and madness. Uh, moving on to Kids Rule, what were your influences for, for that story, and were you um, happy with the way that it turned out up until the point of its censorship? What, what started off Kids Rule, um, I, it was the, there was an iconic piece of graffiti, which was, I think, a football, damn it, well, it was something rule, okay, and at the time, or, or round about then, there was, um, there was that graffiti, George Davis is innocent, okay. Uh, George Davis was a small-time thug and crook who actually wasn't innocent but was innocent of the particular thing that he'd been put down on this particular occasion for. And people were digging up cricket pitches about it and saying he was, you know. And there was a lot of... Uh, there was, it, was a, it was a kind of cant phrase, something rules OK. And I just thought, kids rule OK, I like that. How can... what can I do with it? What's, you know, is there something there? You always start off with an idea, and you say, is there something there? Can you keep this going? Is there something that will interest not just readers, but the editor? Because basically you're trying to sell it to the editor. And I had read, uh, oh, things like uh, William Golding's Lord of the Flies, and things, but not for ages. I didn't sort of reread it or anything like that. I just like the idea of a some fell disease felling all you know people over the age of about 25 uh, it, it seemed to me that something like that could happen and if something could happen shit I'm sorry and uh, and leaving you know young people apart from and I had these for future you know the idea of future stories uh, apart from a few old people who weren't you know struck by the by the play, and I started it off with a one-page kind of intro, a prologue, in which people are sort of dying and, and gasping and, and all that. And when I pitched the idea to Jeff Camp, he said, "Terrific! I love it. Love it. Let's let's go with it." And I said, "Look, can you give me Mike White, the artist? Uh, Mike White was then." Um, the artist for uh, my other strip at the time on action, uh, Hell's Highway. And he was a bloody brilliant artist. I mean, he really was. He was utterly wasted. Uh, he'd started off by doing football strips. And I'd spotted him, and uh, he'd sort of got on to, they'd, they'd asked him to do um, Hell's Highway. And we really clicked. And I used to, I mean, in my scripts, I used to basically write to him, to talk to him as the artist and uh, say, look, Mike, can you do this, blah, blah, blah. And, and he loved all that and he was a terrific artist. And I said, look, can we have him on Kids Rule? And so he, he could take on the work. He was a fast artist. He was a very detailed artist, but he was, he was, a, he was a good producer. He was a fast artist. So he could certainly do, you know, three or four, well, no, four, four or five pages a week. 
Um, I mean, it, it needed a bit of work, but uh, he, you know, he could do it. And uh, he, he was just brilliant. And in a sense, when I saw the first, the artwork for the first uh, instalment, uh, the way he'd done it, uh, it, it was just so exciting. I mean, I loved it. I thought, Christ, you know, this is going to work. And um, I, I had plans for, we, uh, my then wife and I, uh, Anne, we went up to Scotland for a holiday and I was going to bring all the kids, the, the, my heroes, were going to be moving somehow up to Scotland, uh, Battle of the Glens and all this sort of stuff. And, and uh, I, I like the idea of places like Fort William in ruins and, and Edinburgh in ruins and, and, and kind of, you know, uh, all kinds of things happening. And, uh, of course, it never got to that. And uh, it, it, what happened, it was one of the, it was one of the strips that, uh, that was taken up by the, uh, by the Sun or the Daily Mirror and it was uh, taken up, I think, in Parliament. Uh, it was taken up by the sort of naysayers, and it wasn't helped <laughs> by an absolutely brilliant uh, front cover by Carlos, uh, Carlos Esquera, uh, of a, uh, a, a chain-wielding kid whirling, it, I think, in Trafalgar Square, and a policeman People say, now it wasn't supposed to be a policeman. It was supposed to be a policeman. A policeman lying there, looking up, going, oh, like that. And this kid, and it was, I, I, I hesitate to say, it was iconic. It was, a, it was terrific. Uh, you know, and uh, things like that didn't help, I have to say. Uh, and what happened was that suddenly, uh, Jeff Kemp uh, disappeared. Um, I mean, things got terribly hot for him um, uh, uh, politically. I mean, internal politics in IPC. And uh, a chap called um, John Smith took over the editing. And then came the crash. And I had done scripts up, oh, I don't know, I'd probably done about half a dozen scripts beyond what the actual story ended at and what they did to me they they just they just took out uh, all the violence all the I mean I remember there was one picture I think I've got a vague idea in a cellar and one of my heroes is being attacked by something or someone and in Mike White's original I mean you could see there were knives or clubs or something these had all been blacked out uh, the police cadets were attacking the kids in in some sort of cellar and all their all the sort of weapons were blacked out and all and it just, it just looked absurd and stupid what actually happened was that um, IPC, because of all the, presumably you're going on about this in the, in, in the programme, because of what happened to the paper, questions were asked in, par in Parliament, WH Smith were saying, you know, we cannot handle this magazine, uh, it, it, you know, if it continues we'll black, uh, uh, I am told that WH Smith said we will black uh, all IPC products, all their magazines. Uh, uh, action came off the market and what they gave us was a man called Sid Bicknell who was the kind of overseer he was the safest pair of hands in IPC because he'd been with IPC since the amalgamated press in the late 1930s and he was a jobs worth of the first degree I mean he really was and everything that was the faintest bit political uh, I remember in, uh, uh, in um, Hell's Highway, they cut out all, a lot of stuff about... Q I had refugees being helped by um, my two heroes in Hell's Highway, and they were Cuban refugees. And the word Cuban was taken out of the script, out of the actual uh, um, artwork. And everything that was of a vaguely, faintly political nature was just 
blacked out, cut out completely. And I don't think that was from on high, from, you know, from Westminster or anything. I think that was internally in IPC. I think Sid was given the task and told, make this the sweetest, soothest, um, um, sort of most emollient comic that you can. And that's, and that's basically what he did. And uh, he simply, uh, I think there was one, there was one story which didn't even come back. A story called, which in fact was written, I think, by Jeff Kemp himself. Uh, and that was deemed to be so awful because it was a probationer and the probation service and all this sort of stuff. Uh, they could, I mean, they couldn't even um, sweeten it up or anything. I remember with Kids Rule, when it came back, all the villains, uh, the kid villains that I'd, I'd made really unpleasant and nasty, uh, they were all sort of sweetness and light and saying, you know, they were all sort of social workers and things like that. It was just dreadful. I mean, I was, I, was, I was just champing at the bit and wanting to hit someone or kick Sid, <coughs> kick Sid Bicknell's ankles. I think you're doing everything here because I think... One of the good things about, uh, uh, about action was that we were allowed a certain um, looseness of language. Up till then, in, in the old days of Lion and, uh, and Thunder and, uh, and Valiant, um, you couldn't say anything. You couldn't even say damn. It was very difficult almost to say darn. Darn was sort of all right, but I mean, uh, uh, anything worse than darn you could. And with action, um, certainly I, I, I sort of cottoned onto this quite, quite happily because uh, you could use words like hell, damn, blast. I think I might have even used my god at some stage. Um, and one of uh, Hell's Highway, uh, um, one of their, one of their, the two lads, the two main characters, the two heroes' favourite word was hellfire, and it would be you know hellfire. Look, those guys are coming to kill us. You know, and uh, I remember when it came back, uh, someone was. I think it was one of one of them was called Danny, and he was shooting a, a machine submachine gun, and he said, "Heck fire!" I looked at this, and I thought, "Christ, I won't be able to hold my head up in circles in 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 writers' circles." Heck fire! What kind of word is that? What does it mean? Heck fire! And that was Sid Bicknell. I put it down to Sid. Uh, it, it... Not really. Um, no, not really. I mean, what? Basically, I mean, we were such a load of breadheads. That's not true. Um, we were caring uh, uh, and, uh, and terribly very good people. Um, but w we were um, so fed up with the fact that we lost, basically, a, you know, an income. Uh, and when you've got a mortgage to pay and all that sort of thing, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite frightening what, what can happen when suddenly you lose uh, you know, two thirds of your income. And so you go out looking for more work. 2000 AD came along, and the weird thing about 2000 AD, especially in the in the early parts of it, in the early um, sort of issues, first up to about up, you know, issue 100. I mean, in in many ways, it was just as violent as uh, as action. Um, but of course, it was science fiction. It was fantasy. It wasn't real. It wasn't you know, it wasn't sort of, well, it, it wasn't real. It, 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 it was fairy tale uh, violence. See, it, that didn't matter. Um, although, in fact, it, it, to a certain, you, you, you still couldn't go. I remember I was asked to do uh, an early dread. In fact, I was asked to do half a dread story, uh, which would have been if you remember, Dread started in part in number two of of, uh, of 2000 AD, and it started with the judge rushing out, looking uh, um, on his bike, and looking for someone. I can't remember who. A judge killer. A, a judge killer, or so, something along those lines. Yeah, 
Well, what my half of the story was going to be about was the judge uh, was dread in the execution chambers um, executing a, uh, a felon and then it came out on the on the radio or you know sort of uh, uh, someone go uh, judge uh, whitey's killed a judge oh it was whitey it was someone called whitey whitey's killed a judge and dread would then rush off and that was when you saw him in in the first few frames of of uh, the first dread story and what i had to do was um, come up with about 12 frames of the judge executing a felon and so I dreamed up this thing whereby the felons were um, in this execution chamber and they had, they had, um, there was a sort of runnel where they, they had to sort of be somehow positioned over so that if they bled, it didn't go on the floor because it, it had to be very neat and clean and terribly like that. I came up with all this sort of stuff and, uh, and I, I was sort of congratulating myself, thinking, guys, this is what they want, because I'd been told uh, by, uh, it was Pat and someone else, and I don't think it was Jeff Kemp, and it wasn't Kemp, you know, make it as violent as possible, because this is going to be a very violent thing. And uh, I did this, and I sent the script in, and, uh, you know, someone rang me up and said, yeah, great, yeah, we're going to put it. And of course, when I, I got, the, I got paid for it, everything. And, uh, uh, when number two came out, I was sort of thinking, what, what the hell's the execution chamber? And nobody had, uh, had, had wanted to come and tell me and say, I'd say, uh, no, we can't do this, it's too violent. Uh, you can't have, you know, sort of special um, sort of pipes to carry the blood away in an execution, <laughs> and all this sort of thing. And uh, the script itself was actually, someone got hold of it and did it in one of those fan magazines about 10 years ago. So in fact, it, did it, it was actually um, published, but, um, but otherwise, 2018 actually was quite violent, but it wasn't real violence.